Good afternoon, and thank you for being here. Uh, I'm Dan Porterfield, President and CEO of the Aspen Institute. It's a privilege to introduce this conversation, The State of American Capitalism, part of our McCloskey Speaker Series and the kickoff event for this year's Aspen Economic Strategy Group meeting. Thank you so much to Bonnie and Tom McCloskey for making this series possible, and to Hank Paulson and Erskine Bowles for their leadership of the Aspen Economic Strategy Group. Please join me in thanking all of them for making today possible. Uh, it's also great to welcome uh, our immediate past chair and vice chair, Bob Steele, who's here, as well as other members of the Aspen Institute board, the greatest board in America, in my opinion, uh, 70 years ago, led by the great industrialist, Walter Pepke. Um, a group of business leaders and academics came together right here on this ground beneath these majestic mountains and in the aftermath of World War II to reflect upon in all of our flawed and fragile humanity, how could we create and protect a free, just, and equitable society? That is the vision of the Aspen Institute. And it's this calling at this moment is especially important. The Aspen Economic Strategy Group and today's conversation are perfect examples of this critical mission. We're joined by the Chair of the Federal Reserve, Janet Yellen, who, who was responsible for guiding U.S. monetary policy and serving as one of the most influential voices in both American and global economies. Dr. Yellen was formerly the President and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco and is a Professor Emerita at the University of California, Berkeley. She is now a distinguished fellow with the Economic Studies Program at the Brookings Institution. We're so pleased that Kevin Warsh joins us today as well, a leader in finance and economic research who served as a member of the Board of Governors for the Federal Reserve for a brief period during Dr. Yellen's tenure and was representative to the G20. Prior to his service at the Federal Reserve, Kevin served as Special Assistant to the President for Economic Policy and Executive Secretary of the White House National Economic Council he is now Shepherd Family Distinguished Visiting Fellow in Economics at the Hoover Institution. Today's conversation will be moderated by Neil Irwin. Neil is the author of How to Win in a Winner-Take-All World and was a founding staff member of The Upshot, the New York Times site for analytical and explanatory journalism. Neil is now the senior economics correspondent at the New York Times. Even as we host convenings with remarkably influential thinkers and leaders like today, the Aspen Institute is also working around the country in practical and hands-on and nonpartisan ways to promote economic, educational, and social opportunity, which is the future of American capitalism. Supported, for example, by Michael Bloomberg, we created the American Talent Initiative, which in just two years has, gal has galvanized the enrollment of more than 7,200 low and moderate income students in the very finest universities in the country, uh, a pathway to upward mobility. Supported by J.P. Morgan Chase, we're working with 100 community college presidents all around the country in the next few years to develop strategies to increase the pathways for uh, strong students from very modest backgrounds to go from school right to good jobs. Many of those students in those schools that we're supporting are adults, of course. Along with such initiatives that are working at the level of major institutions and major organizations, the Aspen Institute has a special responsibility, I would argue, to promote the future of American capitalism by finding, by, by our, through our work, to find, do, join, and support work in grassroots communities. And that's why, for example, led by our Vice President, Crystal Logan, we're working to develop the next chapter of our service to the economies and the young people of the Roaring Fork Valley right here. That's so important to who we are. It's why we teamed up with David Brooks, the New York Times journalist, to create a project weave that's finding difference makers at grassroots levels all around the country, women and men who are solving problems by bringing people together, and rejecting an us versus them mentality, and many of those programs or those, those, the, the problems they're working on have to do with economic opportunity and mobility. And that's why in sept early September, we'll be able to announce both a seven-figure gift and an eight-figure gift 
in our work to expand opportunities in rural communities on the one hand, and on the other, for a group of young people called Opportunity Youth, which are people 16 to 24 in rural and urban communities who are not in school, not in work. All of this is a part of creating the future of American democracy and American capitalism. We're working with people in communities at the grassroots, not just the mountaintops, all across the country, from the Delta to Detroit, from Oakland to the Eastern Carolinas. Um, and also, I want to emphasize, in the city of Baltimore. We, the ASP Institute, is in love with the city of Baltimore. <laughs> We're working with Hopkins. We're working with the Annie E. Casey Foundation. We're working with the community Sandtown Winchester. We created a whole report called the State of Play Baltimore to get kids up and out involved in physical activity equitably all across the city. We're working with opportunity youth programs in Baltimore. We're working to promote economic development in Baltimore. I'm from Baltimore, <laughs> but I hope that all of us today are Baltimoreans. Thank you. And now I'm so delighted to invite our panelists to get the conversation going. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dan. So uh, you may not be aware of it, but this is a special anniversary uh, happening this month. This is the 10th anniversary of the expansion in the United States. Uh, if we are not in a recession already, which we probably aren't, uh, that makes the longest expansion on record. Uh, you both played a role in, in making it happen. But I wonder if we can go back in time about 10 years uh, to the beginning of this expansion, summer of 2009. Um, I think if we could go back in time and uh, I could tell you, this is, we're turning the corner, the economy is going to grow for the next 10 years uh, at least. I think you'd be pleasantly surprised and, and relieved. That was a very dark period. I've, I've read the transcripts of your Fed meetings during that period, and, and it was a very scary time, and nobody knew what, what the future held. I think you'd be pleasantly surprised by that result. At the same time, I think you'd also be surprised at what it has taken to achieve that, the amount of monetary easing, the years of uncertainty, the, uh, the, what, what a hard slog this has been. So what do we know now that we didn't know 10 years ago? What, what does the nature of this expansion teach us about uh, how the world economy has changed? Janet? Well, uh, I certainly, for one, was very surprised at how much monetary policy and fiscal, initially fiscal stimulus, it took uh, to get recovery that's finally brought us to full employment. At first, I think we know that financial crises cause great damage in, a re in an economy. Um, they cause a great deal of risk aversion among investors and among businesses. Households had huge overhangs of debt, uh, and they would need to work those off in order for spending to be revived. So there was reason to believe um, it would be a tough slog to generate a recovery. But uh, I never would have believed at the beginning that interest rates would be at zero for seven full years. And uh, as some of the... Uh, headwinds from the crisis, like the overhang of debt, um, began to wear off, and it still seemed to require very low interest rates to keep the economy on track. Um, researchers began to recognize that actually um, interest rates in most advanced countries had been gradually declining at least for a decade before the crisis, and that there were deeper forces that were leading to drags on economic growth and on spending. Um, our, our former colleague, Ben Bernanke, uh, termed it a global savings glut. So I think we realized that there were forces that were leading in the global economy to a lot of saving and very weak investment spending. And ultimately, the level of interest rates is determined by the factors that influence saving and investment. And when there's a lot of saving and the demand for those funds is weak, it requires very low interest rates to keep the economy on track. And um, most researchers think this reflects slow productivity growth and aging populations, slower growth in the global economy requires less investment spending and increased demand for safe assets. 
But I think the new normal now looks like it will be a world in which, in advanced countries, interest rates remain low for the foreseeable future. And uh, of course, interest rates in the United States, the short rate's up to 2.5%. Um, in Europe and Japan, we're still at zero. We're negative interest rates. But these are exceptionally low interest rates by historical standards, and it reflects those deeper forces. Seems like in that story, almost the, the crisis accelerated some things that were happening more gradually and, and made Yes, I think there were already these structural forces in train, and then the financial crisis added, added to that. Kevin? So, um, so guys, thank you very much. Um, first, let me say thank you to Dan and to, to Neil, Janet, and I are thrilled to be here. Uh, thank you to Bob. Um, we should also thank someone else um, for this, President Trump, because he passed over the two of us to run the <laughs> Fed. So we, we would be having a much tougher weekend, Janet or I. We'd be grinding away on Constitution Avenue, just trying to figure out what to do. You'd be tweeted about much more frequently. You'd be tweeted about. Neil would be writing these, these brutal stories about how the committee's falling apart and the rest. So instead, we get to be here with you. So, <laughs> so, so, so thank you very much. Um, I, I, I think over the next 45 minutes or so, you're going to hear uh, from Janet and me. And, um, and you might even hear a little disagreement, but I will tell you, I have not worked with a more dedicated public servant than Janet. And it, in, in the darkest days of the crisis, we used to meet in Ben's office at all hours, um, and, uh, and we would say, so what time is it in San Francisco? And I would say, it's a terrible time there, too. And, and um, she was running the San Francisco Fed at the time, and we would call her. She was steady, she was team-oriented, she would keep our confidences as close as necessary. She would provoke us if we sort of thought we were stumbling upon a good idea, she'd sort of ask the obvious question we hadn't confronted, and then we'd have a heck of a family fight about what to do. And Bear Stearns, Lehman, AIG, but listen, I give Ben enormous credit for putting together a team of people who frankly disagreed on some first principles, how the economy works, Disagree on things, but all got along really well. And so Jan and I spent a ton of time together, and um, and uh, I'd say we're, we're we're more fortunate than Chairman Powell is this weekend. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you had a question somewhere in there, Neil. I have. Uh, you can tell stories, but uh. so so ten years ten years later, um, I think I would have believed that the economy would be in uh, in a strong expansion. I be would have believed that. I would have also separately believed that. QE would be on QE 47 and rates would be zero. I just wouldn't have believed both of them together. And so when I look back at the next 10 years, I'm probably too scarred by the crisis. Some people that are in policy making roles might not be scarred enough. But I look over the horizon and I say, those turkeys who come after us, are they gonna have the ammunition, the credibility? We showed up at a time when we had a lot of ammunition and we had a lot of credibility that we inherited from our predecessors and you know, we did an okay job, but we got some things wrong. And I worry over the horizon, this recovery will end like all do. There will be another shock. We will not be perfect forecasters of that shock like we missed the last one. And I worry about the, the legacy we're leaving. So with hindsight, you are a skeptic of some of the easing policies, QE. Uh, do, you, do you stand by those, that skepticism from eight, 10 years ago, or, or have your views changed? Yeah, I think that the easiest way to sort of describe, I'd say, the differences among sort of team players like Janet or me and others isn't on hawks and doves, who's for raising interest rates next week, who's for cutting them. My view of things are about regimes. When you're in a regime where you're in an old-fashioned financial panic, if 2007 was the modern version of the panic of 1907, which gave rise to the Federal Reserve and its third incarnation as a central bank, in panics you do everything. In panics you make up things as you go along. You convince markets and the economy, we will not quit. Every Sunday night you launch a new program. Some of them work, some of them don't. You don't get to do your exhaustive, rigorous, Fed-like analysis, but when the regime turns from panic to recovery, you put your extraordinary tools aside and you see what happens to the real side of the economy. So I think the biggest difference in views at the 10,000 feet among people who have sullied their hands in this, not people on the, on the benches, 
is to figure out what regime you're in and what's the appropriate policy for that regime. My intuitions in 2011, 12, 13, 14 is these were good opportunities to get out of the extraordinary business of quantitative easing. That was not the dominant view around the world. And this is economics, this isn't physics, so we can't prove any of these counterfactuals. But that was the sense of my intuitions then, and I, I would say I, um, I, I stick with them today. So we'll, we'll talk about plenty of economic stuff, but you mentioned it. Uh, one thing you have in common, you both interviewed to be Fed chair with President Trump. <laughs> Uh, what, what's that like? <laughs> what's a job interview with, with Donald Trump like? Well, I thought I had a good interview with President Trump. We um, talked about a lot of economic topics, particularly the pace of economic growth in the United States and how it compares with other countries around the world. And he told me that um, he looked at China, which for decades had double-digit growth rates, um, even now has six plus percent growth. Other um, vibrant emerging market economies with um, at least high single digit growth and wanted to know why growth in the United States was so anemic and couldn't we do better? So the same topic we're discussing right now. <laughs> exactly. Um, uh, I guess I expressed some skepticism that we would be able to achieve growth rates like that and we discussed the reasons for it. He also talked to me about um, the Fed and what it's like to run the Fed and what the role of the chair is in managing what is a very large committee. And so um, we had kind of an interesting discussion about how the Federal Reserve works and how we make decisions and what the role of the chair is in um, trying to foster uh, decision making inside the Fed. Kevin, sound familiar? No comment. <laughs> the only thing I can say about that, I try to avoid this topic, and Neil was a cub reporter. We taught him what central banks do. We explained to him this when he was a Washington Post, Post reporter in 2007. And you would think that he would avoid this kind I, of question. I, I had a lot less gray hair when I, when I, I started coming. I would say the only thing that I can acknowledge in front of this, this large group um, it was reported by one of Neil's colleagues that in my interview, the president said that I was a very good looking man. <laughs> I can neither confirm nor deny he said it, but it, is, it has been reported. <laughs> uh, so if, if, uh, if you were in, con in a you know, hold up in your office in Constitution Avenue, uh, trying to figure out what to do. The Fed is meeting this week, as you may know. It looks very likely they will cut interest rates. Uh, that's been very clearly signaled. Um, do you think that's the right move? What would you be doing if, uh, if you were still in that chair? Um, I would be voting for a 25 basis point cut. And it's not because the US economy is doing badly. Actually, it's doing quite nicely. Um, inflation is low. Actually, inflation, I think, is too low. But it is low. Um, the job market is strong. Um, we are in, the, as you said, the 10th year. This is now, I believe we have now set the record as the longest expansion uh, in recorded history, which goes back to the early 1800s. Um, um, workers are doing better than they have in a long time. The economy seems to be on track. We're still creating 170,000 jobs a month. But the global economy has weakened. I think partly it's weakened because of conflicts over trade and the uncertainty that that's caused for businesses. Um, businesses, not only in the United States, but around the globe, um, are laboring under a great deal of uncertainty about um, what supply chains can look like and will look like in the future. Uh, that uncertainty is in impeding large investment decisions. Um, Trade is diminished, manufacturing is weak, global growth is slowed. I think the impact of our trade policies on China are evident, and China has other reasons that it's slowing. But um, the United States isn't an island. We're part of the global economy. What happens uh, in the rest of the world, in Europe, in Asia, um, affects the United States, and it's also true the US monetary policy affects conditions all around the globe. And um, when the United States 
Titan's policy, and I learned this early on in my own tenure, um, we started to tighten policy and we saw that that had repercussions in many parts of the world that w appeared to be um, weakening financial markets and the prospects for growth globally. Um, so monetary policy affects what happens in the rest of the world and that spills over to the U.S. outlook. So although the U.S. is doing well, I would be focused on wanting to keep it doing well, to keep the expansion on track. Um, and I think in light of the risks, um, I would be inclined to cut a bit. I wouldn't see this as the beginning unless things change of a major easing cycle, but I do think it's appropriate. Markets expect it. It's already built into financial conditions. It's um, a terrible thing if the Fed just does what the market says it wants and expects, but when the market sees the same things the Fed does and anticipates uh, the Fed's actions and the Fed agrees with the logic that's embodied in the market, it's a sensible thing to ratify those expectations. So Kevin, as Janet says, the economy looks pretty good. Just got a good GDP number on Friday. Uh, what, what would you want to do? So everything that Janet, so now we're going to have some fun. Now we're getting to the meat of it. Um, everything Janet said was true when the Fed raised rates in December. So, so it leads to a very difficult situation they're confronting this week. In between the middle of September and the Fed's meeting in December, the global economy was deteriorating at a faster rate than it is today. Global trade, which is an important proxy in my framework for what the economy is going to look like in three or six months, was racing down to growth of between zero and one percent. The economies among our big trading partners were weakening. The G2 fight between the U.S. and China was at a very high level. So I try to avoid, not because I'm afraid to tell you what, what, what Janet or I would do when we're there, but I think it's an important lesson. The Fed has been preoccupied for a very long time about where are its dots? What's its dots going to be? When's it going to raise rates this year? We put out dots telling our forecast periodically, way too dot specific. <laughs> Monetary policy decisions matter much more for the reasons they give than the results they offer. And I don't really understand the full rationale for the mix of raising rates in December, cutting them now for the mix of QE, which is on one day and off the next. And I would say the right thing for central bankers to do in the U.S., because central bankers outside the U.S. look to Chair Yellen, look to Chair Powell as a guide to what the most important economy, what the most important central bank is going to do, that story has to be persuasive. It can't just prescribe. The decisions that we give have to have a rationale that's compelling. Businesses and households can then react and so hewing to it because the stock market and bond markets want the Fed to raise this week, that's not the right reason to go. So I think the framework is in need of a serious reform. And to be candid, I think Chairman Powell inherited a much tougher situation than perhaps he appreciated a year and a half ago. So um, I, I think there is a good rationale for cutting at this point. As I said, I think it's slower gro global growth and weakness in the global economy. But another factor that really plays a key role is that inflation is very low. The Fed has a 2% objective. For the last seven or eight years, inflation has been running below 2%. Um, Fed thought with a very tight labor market like we have now, um, no significant supply shocks over the last year, inflation should be running at 2%. Um, even now, uh, the best forward-looking measures of inflation are closer to one and a half. And it looks like inflation expectations are slipping. And that's dangerous because inflation expectations um, play a role in the prices that firms actually set. And when people expect lower inflation, it tends to make that a reality. It has an aspect of self-fulfilling prophecy. We've seen the, the damage that can do in a country like Japan that seems to be trapped into close to zero inflation. 
the concern that's causing in Europe, where inflation is chronically low, running below 2%. And that's been a surprise. I wouldn't have thought that inflation would be this low. It's another reason why the Fed should be a little bit easier, try to get inflation back to 2%, um, not allow in a chronic situation of inflation running this low. So by the way, this is a sign of, of what uh, Kevin's great skill. I don't know that you actually answered the question. So would you, uh, would you, would you, do, the, would you do a rate cut this week or would you? Uh... So uh, a year and a half ago in December, this meeting I would have called timeout and would have designated committees to ask first principle questions that I think we've been taking for granted. Janet raises a right. good one. And I wouldn't be lurching to raise rates, you know, at this meeting or cut rates at the prior meeting. I just don't think that's the right. I understand why markets want it. I understand why Aspen is doing so well in having a budget surplus. <laughs> the QE, the QE post crisis in the U.S. and around the world has done wonderful things for people in this room. But I would say what we should be focused on is the real economy, and I think we need to go back to first principles. So Janet just raised a good first principle, which is inflation. The remit given to the Federal Reserve by the Congress is price stability. The Fed has interpreted that quite explicitly in the last decade as price stability means inflation of 2.0%. Now my judgment is we should spend more time looking to the left side of the decimal point, not the right side of the decimal point. We really don't know what the change in prices is in a dynamic economy that is fundamentally different than the set of national accounts from which we try to distill price signals. Um, when we debated whether the price stability objectives should be marked at 2.0% inflation, or for example, 1.5% inflation, there was a very good case from a lot of very knowledgeable people that we should interpret the price stability goal as 1.5%. Had we done so, which may or may not have been the right decision, we would have said mission accomplished. So this judgment that we made amid uncertainty strikes me as an insufficient justification for in a 10th or 11th year of economic prosperity with very little conventional and unconventional ammunition, should there be a shock or recession that isn't sufficient. But for our friends at the Fed, if they wanted a story, Chair Yellen just gave them a very good narrative and they should try sticking to it. Well, the lower inflation is on an average basis, the lower are the average level of nominal interest rates in the economy. And we're already in a world where interest rates are very low. If inflation is allowed to slip, the average level of interest rates will slip even further. And um, without using unconventional policy, the conventional policy tool of the Fed is short-term interest rates. Um, his, historically, before the crisis, short-term interest rates average around 4, 4.5%. Four now, the nor even with 2% inflation, the normal level um, of short-term interest rates is likely only slightly above 2%. That means there's very little scope for the Fed to cut rates to respond to a recession. Do we want interest rates to fall yet lower, um, meaning the Fed will have even fewer tools to fight a future crisis? Um, especially in a world of low interest rates, I think it's important that the Fed defend its 2% inflation target. So on a slightly different topic, uh, the Federal budget deficit has widened a lot over the last few years, uh, even at a time of, of near full employment. Uh, and yet, all the things that I learned as an undergraduate are the reasons you want to worry about deficits have not happened. We don't have overheating. We don't have inflation. We don't have higher interest rates. Um, uh, so what's going on? Is are, are deficits something we should be worried about right now? Uh, how, how do you interpret this, this development? So as far as I can tell, there's a new policy consensus in Washington. It goes something like this. I hope I don't offend people here. Um, when Democrats are in power in the White House, Republicans are for fiscal austerity and ba balanced budget deficits that are neutral, but the roles are reversed. When Republicans are in power, Democrats and their need for, for having a balanced fiscal situation, that seems to be lacking too. So I see a bipartisan consensus away from the kind of economics 101 that you read and Janet taught. So here's my view for what it's worth. Um, 
We have doubled our nation's debt over the last five and a half years, but we've let Congress get away with it. How is that? As we've more than doubled our debt, interest expense paid by Congress is lower, not higher. So they're not having to include in their calculations this idea that interest rates will ever go up. This is a dangerous phenomenon. Now, why are interest rates so low? I share part of Janet's view, which is part of that is what's happening in the discrepancies between savings and investment. But we can't sort of be immune to this as central bankers. The largest owner of US Treasury securities used to be the Chinese. Now it's the Federal Reserve. $13 trillion of sovereign debt around the world is now trading at negative levels. So to describe negative interest rates, let me just sort of practice this. You go out to take out a mortgage, and the bank says, fine, you can take out a mortgage, and every month they send you a check. <laughs> so Neil began by saying, but everything's okay. There's not these imbalances in the world. Surely there are. This is not normal. Could this non-normal behavior continue for a decade? Could the world's central banks end up buying the securities of our sovereigns? You bet that can, but I don't want to be left with the misimpression this is okay. And I'm afraid that there is now this pressure on both sides to somehow suggest that there's a free lunch here. There is no free lunch. There's a new name for this idea that deficits don't matter, and it's no longer a conservative Republican thing. Now it seems to be a liberal Democratic thing. They call it modern monetary theory. Um, that's a new name for an old temptation. It conflates monetary policy and fiscal policy, and it's 0 for 3, sort of what they used to teach us about the Holy Roman Empire. It was neither holy nor Roman nor an empire. <laughs> Kevin, I'm shocked you're not an MMT guy. <laughs> Janet? Um, so I agree to some extent with Kevin about the dangers of large deficits and debt. Um, so I see the reason that we're in a low interest rate environment is not just something the Fed foolishly decided to do, but it's a reflection of lots of savings and weak investment in the U.S. and the global economy. So I see that as structural and something that won't disappear um, for the foreseeable future. In a world of low interest rates, as Kevin, you just said, um, although the debt to GDP ratio in the United States has more than doubled since 2007, before the crisis it was about 35%, it's now 78%. As um, you said, interest payments on the debt are about the same or slightly lower as a share of the economy than they were before the crisis. So I think that means we can handle more debt. Um, with low interest rates, having a more debt on a normal basis is something that's manageable because the interest cost is less. Um, so I guess that's one thing I think, but I very much worry long term about debts, debt and deficits because the debt to GDP ratio is not on a stable path in the United States. Um, if you want to um, give yourself a good scare and are having trouble sleeping some night, I suggest reading the Congressional Budget Office's long term um, deficit and debt projections. And what you see is, no matter how you vary the assumptions, you see a set of commitments to uh, Social Security, Medicare, and um, projections for healthcare costs rising more rapidly than inflation and an aging population. Those forces that can't quickly be, can't be really reversed giving rise to debt to GDP ratios that over the next 40 or 50 years just uh, increase exponentially, astronomically. That's something we've known about for 30 years. Um, when I was in the Clinton administration in the White House, um, we made it a priority to try to deal with it, uh, to put in place changes to taxes or uh, to entitlement spending or to overall spending to deal with that, to deal with that. Nothing's been done. 
and that is a frightening long-term future. And so, yeah, low interest rates, um, it, it makes a slightly more expansionary fiscal policy possible, but we still have a very serious fiscal problem on our hands. Yeah, so, so I agree with that. I'll just add one, um, one point. So because our fiscal situation in the U.S. is deteriorating, we shouldn't confuse that with the relative rank of our fiscal solvency versus all of our big trading partners. I, I will say this in reference to J.P. Morgan, not just because I think they're sponsoring half the events around here, but, <laughs> but um, the, the analogy to the crisis, um, in my judgment, all the banks would have all disappeared. They would have all been insolvent, but J.P. Morgan was the least insolvent, would have been the last one to go. So that's the United States. We are in the strongest fiscal situation relative to our counterparts. We need to lead by example instead of showing them the path to, to oblivion. And the truth is I do think there will be a sovereign debt crisis in the next 30 years. It's unlikely to happen here because of our relative strength. And when that happens, what happens to our interest at cost? They'll go down further. There'll be a rush to the US, a rush to safety, a rush to dollar-denominated securities. So I wish I could tell you there was some market pricing that would try to constrain legislators. I don't see it, so that's why I think it's incumbent upon those of us on stages like this and at the Federal Reserve, who come from different parties but really share a very common view about these things, to not give license for them to go down that road, which is a very dangerous one and will do harm to the least well-off among us. So from the risks of public debt to, to private debt, uh, the easy money, it's fueled a stock market boom, it's fueled booms in, in a number of loan markets, leveraged loans, uh, non-financial corporate debt. Uh, do we have the next financial bubble building beneath our eyes, or should we be nervous about this buildup of private debt in the economy? So I guess I would say um, in a low interest rate world, it's quite natural that price earnings ratios are going to be high, and that's one reason why the stock market is so high. Um, the equity premium or the gap between the rates of return on stock and bonds, it's a little low, but it's not uh, abnormally low. So it's certainly true the stock market is high, but I wouldn't be prepared to call that a bubble. Um, I am very worried about the surge in corporate debt. There's been uh, an enormous buildup in debt in non-financial non corporations, um, particularly lower rated non-financial corporations. And it's not been for the purpose of investment. It's been more to finance stock buybacks uh, and to pay dividends. Um, and I think if the economy weakens and we go into a recession, there's going to be a great deal of corporate distress and bankruptcy. And firms that are in trouble will cut back on investment spending and will fire workers, and it will make the next uh, recession the more difficult. Recession into a severe recession. It absolutely could. So I agree with <coughs> what Janet said there. Um, we've gone from $6 trillion to $10 trillion of corporate debt, which in and of itself shouldn't bother us. Stock markets are up, household wealth is up, business confidence is up. But what have we done with that incremental $4 trillion? To Janet's point, we did not invest, our corporations did not invest that money in property, plant, equipment, software. So as a result, over the last decade, we've had productivity statistics that have been abysmal. Productivity matters because that's the future of our economy. Potential growth in the next 10 years are a function of how many people in this country go to work and how many hours they work and how productive are those hours. And because of the lack of investment of that leveraging up, it looks to me like we're taking on collectively risks. Those risks will ultimately be borne by very aggressive central bankers. And again, we're betting too much of the house that everything's benign. Boy, that reminds me of a period that preceded us. I showed up at the Fed in 2006. The great moderation, everything was swell. We just do a little of this, a little of that, and everything would work out. Again, I'm probably too scarred by that crisis. I think I'm more scarred than Janet is. Well, I'm pretty scarred, too. <laughs> and, uh, uh, let's see. I, I, I've got quite a few scars. And I think you're absolutely right. We should be worried about it. Um, on balance, I think the financial system is safer in a number of ways, uh, importantly, than it was back in 2006. Banks are better capitalized. There's less leverage in the economy. 
house prices have risen, but mortgage lending standards are generally tight. We're not seeing a buildup of consumer debt, um, although student debt has um, reached very high levels. So I'm not worried too much about a financial crisis, but the, this um, buildup in corporate debt and some other things certainly are of great concern. So I'd like to ask, before we go to your questions, about something that traditionally central bankers don't really get asked about, um, which is climate change. Um, Mark Carney, the governor of the Bank of England, has raised concerns that uh, climate change is not just an uh, existential risk to humanity, but also of economic and financial risk. Uh, there could be risks buried in bank and uh, insurance company balance sheets. Um, how do you think of, of climate as an economic uh, concern, and, and how much is this on your radar? Um, I think it should be on our radar. I think um, the economic implications of climate change are beginning to be apparent. And the most recent national assessment um, certainly indicated that they already thought it was having an impact on growth. Um, it will certainly demand more investment for non-productive purposes, channeling it away from investment in plant and equipment. We're seeing, we're likely to see uh, floods, hurricanes, severe weather uh, cause more um, supply effects, commodity price spikes that can have economic impacts. And um, we're all beginning to realize, I think, that financial institutions, it's a risk to financial institutions. Um, on the one hand, it's loans and the dangers um, that climate change and, and extreme weather events can uh, pose to, um, to, to loans and lead to losses. And it's also um, possible extreme changes in asset values. Um, if we do have significant climate change policy, um, that's likely to make a, could make a significant difference um, to the price of um, carbon emitting um, fuels that are um, valued in the market. So some central banks are doing stress tests of their banks um, and also demanding transparency on the part of firms. And I think that's a direction that's important. Yeah. Sure, so let me make two points. One is um, because of the work of the Bernanke Fed, the Yellen Fed, central banks have now moved to the front pages, not just in the crisis, I told my folks I was going to join the Federal Reserve as a governor in 2006, and my dad said, oh, that's the thing that Greenspan runs. <laughs> now everybody knows. The Federal Reserve from 2008 until today has been on the front page of every newspaper around the world. Kevin, it made my career. I don't, don't. Uh... <laughs> and it's been very good for enterprising young reporters. It is not obvious to me that is good for our country. The founders and our government has divided responsibilities for all sorts of things, and the Federal Reserve has come in to say, we are here to save the day. Now, again, my judgment is in when the crisis strikes, that actually is our job. But these climate change issues are incredibly important. I love what Janet said about central bankers and others having a medium to long-term horizon. I'm in, of the view we should be buying insurance against tail risks, having endured the risks that we did. But I think that should apply to everything, not just climate change. That should apply to whether we're going to fine-tune our inflation target, whether we decide we're raising rates in December and cutting them now because we have some new perfected forecasts. The central bank should be worried about the climate, not the weather, and that doesn't just speak to climate change. <laughs> and with that, uh, thank you. Uh, we will turn to your questions. We have microphones here and here. Let's uh, start up here. Quick question. Can you both please comment on the huge QE holdings of the Fed and what you expect uh, the future of that uh, investment will be? Well, I think the Fed has told us what their plan is. I began to put this plan in motion and it's about to reach a conclusion. Um, the Fed's balance sheet now stands at about $3.8 trillion. Uh, at the end of September, the Fed has said they will stop ru running down, they're gradually running down their balance sheet, allowing some treasuries and mortgage-backed securities to 
um, be redeemed, and their balance sheet is contracting, that contraction will come to an end at the end of September with a balance sheet of about three and three quarters trillion dollars and about one and a quarter trillion dollars of reserves. And uh, then they'll leave it there for a time. As currency demand grows over time, reserves in the banking system will gradually diminish. But the Fed will uh, end up with a much larger balance sheet than it had before the crisis. And they intend, and I would endorse, I believe this is a good idea, that they should manage short-term interest rates, which is their key tool, by moving around uh, the rates of interest they set on excess reserves uh, as their main tool. That is how most central banks around the globe operate. It's not how the Fed operated before the crisis, but I think it's a safer way and it's a more effective way to conduct monetary policy. So, so my guess is um, if, in fact, uh, markets are right and Chairman Powell and his colleagues cut rates at this upcoming meeting, I don't really understand how they'd be cutting rates and loosening policy with one hand and tightening policy by continuing to allow their balance sheet to expand through September. So my guess would be on August 1st, QT will be over coincident with the new rate cutting, however explained by the Federal Reserve, and the financial markets, you could just get a sense of how giddy they are with excitement. That means we could be back to QE37. What could possibly be better for people that own risk assets? I think the world will see that about 11 months ago, central bank balance sheets in aggregate started to fall. QT in various forms were beginning. I think that ends around August 1st. We're still in a period, as Janet rightly said, in the U.S. where the U.S. economy is doing reasonably well, and we are now laying the seeds for the next version of balance sheet expansion. We could have a long discussion which will avoid about how QE transmits itself into the real economy to help real American workers, households, and businesses. We won't do that. <laughs> but I would say this. Um, my judgment is that QE has um, what we call distributional consequences in ways that changes in short-term interest rates do not. And so QE has become a dirty word on talk radio left and right. My preference long would have been, when we were in the crisis, Janet, Ben, myself, and others, we cut rates to zero, we looked around, we needed to come up with something else, we invented QE. Had we not invented it in the US, I would guess that no other self-respecting central bank in the world would have done this. Um, that policy has continued apace. When we did that, I thought we had a more or less an understanding. When things get out of crisis mode, what we will do is shrink the balance sheet because of these distributional consequences and start raising rates. That is not the judgment that was made. And so I think, again, Chairman Powell is stuck with a very difficult set of challenges. But my guess is we are constrained in how much flexibility central banks have here and around the world is that we are back off to the races and quantitative easing will be alive and well 10 or 11 years into the strongest recovery we've had since 1946. I sense you disagree. Well, I would just say um, we resorted to QE because interest rates, short-term interest rates had moved to zero and unemployment remained very high. The economy was not recovering. The labor market was very weak. And we saw an opportunity to bring down longer term interest rates um, in part, but not only, but in part through buying long term assets. Um, when interest rates are low, and I think we're mainly in, as I've said, mainly in a low interest rate environment for structural reasons having to do with saving an investment in the global economy that's not going to go away that does lead to high asset valuations. And it is true that wealth holders, those who hold stock, um, do benefit from that. Of course, it's also been good for houses, which um, are more broadly owned. But when we talk about inequality and what's good and what's bad for it, the most important thing for the largest number of Americans, particularly those 
with um, less lower paid jobs is to have a strong job market and to see their wages going up. And I don't think the Fed needs to apologize for what it did to promote a strong job market, to bring the unemployment rate down to 3.7%. And I think we should celebrate the fact that um, what the gains we're seeing now in this strong labor market are going disproportionately to those with less education, less skill, and minorities. Um, they're seeing the largest wage gains. They're getting training because firms are having a tough time hiring workers, and at long last, they're willing to invest in people who may not be the ideal hire. And, um, to be willing to hire people, for example, all those, those with criminal records who, in a less strong job market, would have a tough time getting a job at all. And so distributionally, I, I can't agree that this policy has been adverse. Too nice. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, it's too nice a day for an extended discussion of monetary transmission mechanisms. But uh, let's, uh, how about up, uh, up here? Iran and other countries would love that the dollar um, be replaced as a standard in world economy, especially with the sanctions they've received. Can you discuss what the options are that are being discussed and whether cryptocurrencies might play a role? So um, thanks for that lighthearted question. Um, <laughs> You want to go back to monetary transmission mechanisms? So, so let me say a couple of things. Um, in spite of, because of, however you want to describe the conduct of economic policy in the last several years, the last decade, the dollar is more important as the world's reserve currency today than at any point in the history of the world. That speaks to things in the US, it also speaks to things outside the US. In order to be displaced as the world's reserve currency, someone's got to be doing many of the things that Jan and I would have recommended on fiscal sustainability, on deepening capital markets, on trying to have a more dynamic economy so that merit will decide who enters the labor force, who gets promoted, et cetera. Our peers around the world don't look like they're giving us a great threat. So the dollar is more important. When a merchant in the Middle East is doing a piece of small business with another merchant um, in Europe, they denominate that in dollars. This is still the beacon of stability and security in the world. It accrues huge benefits to American workers, to the US and the US government. If we squander that, if we try to take advantage of that, if we say, you see, we've got this forever, it's a permanent monopoly, it's a birthright of the US, we will lose it. And it's of huge, huge benefits, not only as a matter of economic policy, but as you reference, also as a matter of national security policy. And when times get tough, the dollar is more in demand, not less. But that's not an excuse for us to do things that are myopic. It's an excuse for us to think about the climate, not the weather. With respect to cryptocurrencies, I would say um, there has been an attempt in different regards, small and large, to do things that might take the monopoly powers that central banks have, this printing press we have, and say, well, you're not going to need that printing press anymore because we in the private sector are going to do it. My suspicion, I'm a has-been, I've been out for eight and a half years, is the world's central bankers aren't going to give up that monopoly power too lightly. Anything to add? Uh, let's go to the middle. It's not working. Oh, we're back. Thank you. Uh, oh, let's, let's go uh, which back one? here first and then oh, to you. Yep. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Two people in the middle. Sorry about that. Thank you. Um, my name is Greg Hammer. I'm with Business Climate Leaders. And you have said, Janet, that the textbook solution to deal with the climate crisis is a carbon tax. This week, this past week, four carbon pricing pieces of legislation were introduced. And another one has, was introduced earlier this year in January. I wonder what, Kevin or Janet, you can say to this audience here today to compel them to understand why they should, especially in an up economy, learn about and back a price on carbon while there is still a chance. Because without a working planet, no other cause matters. And we have to get this tackled. Please. So I totally agree with you. I um, 
spearheaded an economist statement last spring on a carbon tax or something I should call a carbon dividends plan. It's a plan that um, the origins of it were with George Schultz and James Baker who put forward the idea that a carbon tax would be an effective way to deal with uh, climate change, that the proceeds of it could be rebated back to the population. And if that were done as they and I've proposed um, on a per capita basis, we would be talking about a lot of money. With a $40 um, carbon tax, that would amount to $2,000 per household. And um, it would make the vast majority of households would gain a lot more than they would lose because of the tax. So distributionally, um, I see that as something that's very attractive and polls it, um, polls very, very well. And I think a carbon tax is the ideal solution to the problem of climate change. The problem is that when um, carbon-based fuels are burned and release carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, that creates harm. And we need to put a price on it or create a penalty so that those who engage in actions that cause that harm bear the consequences of it. And that's exactly what a carbon tax does. And unlike many sectoral approaches, um, it gets in every crack. It affects every aspect of the economy, whether it's in automobiles or building or producing energy. It affects every aspect of the economy that generates um, carbon dioxide emissions. So it's an ideal policy, and I believe that if we ever are going to deal with it, we will need bipartisan support. Everyone will need to be on board. So um, the carbon plan that uh, my colleagues and I put forward for a carbon dividends plan is environmentally ambitious. Um, we can be more ambitious even than uh, the Paris climate change uh, agreement was. Um, and um, th this plan has the support of uh, many large firms, including energy firms. British Petroleum, ExxonMobil, Shell, all signed on to this. And the reason that businesses like it and think it's business friendly is this is not command and control, detailed um, government regulations about how firms, what they must do, what kinds of equipment they need to put in place. Everybody decides how to, on their own, what's the best way to respond to this set of price of price incentives, and so it's a much less intrusive, more market-friendly way uh, to accomplish goals. So um, environmental organizations have signed on. Uh, our statement gleaned uh, the signatures of 3,500 economists, um, including uh, 15 uh, chairs, former chairs, Republican and Democrat, of the Council of Economic Advisors, all four living Fed chairs, um, and um, I, I really think it's the way to go. So this will have to be our last question. Uh, in the middle there, you had the mic already, yeah. Sure. Between the Fed and the market, which one is the tail and which one is the dog? I'm talking about $13 trillion of uh, negative yielding sovereign debt. It, isn't part of that because of the growth of central bank balance sheets around the world? Kevin? So I'd say in part. Um, so Janet is right that there's something that's been happening to interest rates that are structural, but I think there also has to be a contribution in the world's central banks. Either we've been the ax in these bond markets and in other countries in a lot of other markets, including equities, as the buyer or first resort, and it's worked, in which case we want to say it has lowered yields, it has had this positive effect on the economy, or it hasn't worked. So, listen, I'm all for transparency and central banks sharing with markets their best views, but I think we now find ourselves where we, or excuse me, they central bankers over the last several years share their views with markets. Markets then copy those views. So instead of learning from market prices, distilling market signals, 
and folks like Janet and me asking, well, what are the effects that we should learn from this? What's that telling us about the economy around the corner? Instead, we're giving markets a take-home test, and then when they give the right answer, we say, How, what a wonderful grade you've gotten. I want there to be a little bit of communication in both directions between what central banks say and what markets say. Janet and I and others have our own models of how the economy works. Those models are hardly perfect. An important source of information to help us understand what's around the corner would be market signals unless we conflate those. So I think there needs to be a new discipline in the communication between central banks and markets, markets back to central banks. And no, I don't believe that markets will particularly like that. I think they've really quite gotten used to this. Again, in the crisis, we did it for a reason. We told them to stay with us. We will make this economy strong again. We will get us out of this crisis. And we were getting them to buy into what we created. That was in the greatest crisis since the Great Depression. That isn't 10 years into a strong global economy. Markets need to exert their own discipline, and I think the central bank in the US could be taking steps in that direction, which are not too disruptive. Anything to add to close? I'll, I'll just give Kevin the last word. <laughs> Thank you so very much for a, for a great discussion. Janet Yellen, Kevin Worsley.